Hey, what's up, guys? Richard here back with Cosmic Human Design. We're going through all 64 the hexagrams, which, as you guys know, are um, you know from the I Ching and uh, kind of the basis of human design and the gene keys. Um, except here we're looking at uh, the the book I Ching Oracle: The Cosmic Way, which, if you don't know, is kind of this uh, new version of the I Ching which um, comes directly from the cosmic consciousness and gives us the cosmic meaning, the true meaning of all the hexagrams. And it's really mind blowing. It's really revolutionary the way uh, the stuff this book talks about and it will really change your life. Um, and here we have a, a good example in hexagram 53 of uh, some of the new names that are given to the hexagrams that expand upon their meaning and reveal their true meaning to us. Um, hexagram 53, it's usually known, for example, as um, developing or uh, gradual development, uh, something like that. But here we have the, the meaning, the name, developing the true self, um, which is a lot more clear than simply developing or gradually developing. You know, this makes it clear what exactly the I Ching is talking about. It's developing your true self, which if you've followed this series and all the hexagrams, you know that there's kind of this uh, this thing going on, this battle going on, if you will, between the, uh, the true self and the ego and the cosmos and the collective ego. And the ego is kind of this false self that uh, is made up of these different words and phrases um, that kind of programs your mind. It's like this consciousness virus um, that uh, covers up your true self. Um, and in human design, we talk about conditioning. Well, I believe the ego is that conditioning and the, the world of homogenization, you know, um, where, where everyone has a, uh, a mask that they wear, an ego. Um, but there's nothing good about the ego. You know, that's what's been revealed to us throughout this book. Nothing at all. And it's kind of our cosmic purpose, our cosmic duty to free our true selves from, from our ego and to recognize it when it appears, to say no to it. The inner no is the most effective means of, uh, of fighting the ego. Um, so here we go. Developing the true self. Well, this should be a fun one. We have wind over mountain, wind over mountain, the judgment, developing the true self. The maiden is given in marriage. Good fortune, clarity brings duration. Developing the true self is the process described by this hexagram as gradually increasing, affirming the true self as the leader of the personality. This is done by the systematic step-by-step -step removal of the seed phrases and images that make up the ego. In this process, a person's sense of wholeness, which had been divided and distorted by the collective ego, becomes restored. Coinciding with this restoration is the person's return to unity with the cosmos. As this removal progresses, the true self, which was arrested, arrested in its development during childhood, grows up. Its growing up is symbolized by the development of a young wild goose from a gooseling to a fully fledged goose, which development is pictured in the lines. The wild goose was traditionally interpreted as a symbol of conjugal fidelity. In cosmic terms, however, the development of the goose is a metaphor for the development of a person's loyalty to his inner truth, which occurs through freeing himself from false loyalties to another person or institution. The process by which the ego is decreased layer after layer can only safety, safely take place under the guidance of the sage, because only the sage knows how much the psyche can accomplish at any given time. And the order in which the different aspects of the ego's program, we're talking about a program here, need to be removed to avoid psychological problems. The process leads through many handhold understandings toward increasing clarity. It is like climbing a rock face. Each handhold allows an increase in the overall view, with no one view being definitive. All actions through which a person's wholeness can be restored are carried out on the inner plane. The action most frequently employed is the saying of the inner no to what is false. The inner no is a person's normal response to statements that are obviously false, such as the moon is made of green cheese. 
However, because speech often contains statements that are half-truths, which seem to be true at first glance, they're often absorbed into our inner programs by default, simply because we have not perceived their implicit falseness. That phrase is absolutely key right there. This is particularly true of the self-doubt created by certain ideas about human nature, such as the statement that evil is due to man's animal nature. This self-doubt and the belief that the individual is not good enough in and of himself keeps the true self a child, full of fears, doubts, and guilt. All mistaken ideas taken into one's inner program remain in effect until the day we say the inner no to them. Wow, incredible. As elements of a false program in the psyche, these ideas comprise the source of the distortions and perversions of one's original nature which is in harmony with the cosmos because it is an integral part of it. It is important and correct to say the inner no to all ideas and beliefs by which the collective ego appropriates our cosmic virtues and turns them to its use. This happens, for example, when our natural loyalty to our inner truth, which would make us say the inner no to each incorrect situation is replaced by the duty to be loyal, loyal to people, groups, the group we and their beliefs, even when it involves going against our inner truth. As can be easily seen, betraying one's inner truth is the true source of evil in society because the inner know is withheld on the basis of partiality to the particular group. Very incredible right there. Incredible knowledge we're getting with this cosmic teaching. I mean, just think about that. The source of true evil in society, the true source of evil is withholding the inner no. It's that simple, and it's that simple. Other cosmic virtues that are similarly appropriated, but this time by declaring them to be part of our higher nature are discipline, kindness, perseverance, and conscientiousness. Before this appropriation, these virtues operate in relation to the harmony of the circumstance. Afterwards, they become dedicated to the ego interests of the group. This is achieved by turning them, turning them into abstract or absolute virtues. Their opposites, disloyalty, wildness, unkindness, impatience, and superficiality are then attributed as vices to our lower nature. Seeing the inner no to every aspect of the ego program engages the helper of transformation which removes the negative effects on the brain caused by having ingested its false phrases. The effect of this transformation, which takes place in the atomic realm, even changes the chromosomes in the body cells that have been affected. Therefore, the change is enduring. Changes in behavior created by any other means, as by forcing oneself to become something through discipline, positive thinking or taking on a new self-image do not lead to transformation. They are part of the collective ego's program of self-development, which consists in working at repressing one's quote unquote lower nature with its so-called instincts and drives, which it sees as the source of evil. The words instincts and drives are formulations derived from incorrect observations made of human behavior after a person's wholeness has been divided and part of it demonized. While the one part is flattered and elevated as superior, the other is demonized as the source of evil. This whole process, the very act of division itself, has put a spell upon both the bodily nature, causing it to behave in perverted ways, and the mind. The perversions caused by the spell are then called animal drives. The slander is put not only upon the self, but upon nature as a whole. What is often overlooked in this picture is what happens to that part of the psyche which, upon being flattered, begins to think of itself as developed, superior, and therefore spiritual. Or if modesty is considered to be the hallmark of spiritual development, it will think of itself no less proudly as modest or humble. All of these become images of self that are to be achieved through work on the self. What these images all have in common is that they are but pretensions that repress the true self. The key feature that betrays the presence of the ego is the work feature that accompanies self-development. That it is work, that it is hard work, 
hard effort shows the difficulty of repressing the true self, which is born with a full quotient of cosmic chi and naturally equipped to express its uniqueness. Constant force must be applied to keep it down. All of the person then has the comfort of being in conformity to the group we, he is all the while pitting himself against nature and the cosmos itself. The work involved in developing the self-image against such, such obstacles is revealed in the extreme conscientiousness that characterizes spiritual ambition. This hard work contrasts with help that comes from nature and the whole cosmos and with the joy, relief, and release a person experiences each time he rids himself of a false inner phrase or image. While effort is involved in seeking out the seed phrases and images that make up the ego's program, his effort is exponentially aided by the cosmos and leads to enduring results. The only thing that makes this effort difficult is when, when he believes the ego's protests that it is hard work and negative work, the latter referring to saying the inner no. <laughs> negative work. <laughs> Learning to say the inner no is the key to bringing the true self to maturity. It is the means by which the true self distances itself from the leadership of the ego within. The inner no also establishes the boundaries around the self that stop the encroachment of the ego and egos and others. It likewise validates one's dignity and integrity and reclaims the true self's correct place in the personality. When said to the ego and another, the inner no has the further, further function of communicating to its true self that it can succeed in liberating itself. Much of the conditioning process of the collective ego involves intimidating the true self into an inability to say the inner no. For this reason, a person first needs to ask through the RTCM, the retrospective three coin method, whether his ability to say the inner no has been partially or completely blocked. If so, he needs to free himself of that impediment. And I'll say this again, I've said it in several episodes, but the RTCM is basically where you can toss three coins with a question in your mind and get an instant response from the cosmos, from the sage, the cosmic teacher who responds to your own consciousness. And for example, three heads would be a yes, definitely. Three no's would be, three tails would be a no, definitely not. And, and then in between there, you've got two combinations of those uh, heads and tails. And you can get clarity about, you know, whatever it is you're thinking by doing that. It's in real time. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's incredible. You can ask, for example, is what is what this person's saying is true? Is what they're saying is true? You can ask that and then it can tell you in real time. So no one ever needs to be misled by, uh, you know, for example, our political leaders any longer, since we have the I Ching and the Sage. I mean, this is actually absolutely world-changing revolutionary stuff right here. It means the media can't lie to us anymore. <laughs> that's what it means, and that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> Anyways, the inner no is to be said to the appearance of the ego in any of its forms, either in oneself or in others. When it is said to another, it is to be combined with the retreat into reserve and neutrality until the ego in him is no longer dominant. One can relate to him safely only when his true self is again present. To hold on to the inner no beyond this time, however, is to take on the task of punishing that person, something that comes from the ego in oneself. Allowing this reverses the transformative effects of the inner no. The ego shows itself in all displays of arrogance, temper, demand, inequality, expectation, guilt, blame, unfeeling behavior, flattery, partiality, careless disregard of others, indifference, envy, jealousy, vindictiveness, vengefulness, idle curiosity, slander, gossip, contrivance, self-righteousness, self-pity, and all self-images, including that of the good person. In whatever ways a person takes on a role or self-image, he betrays his true nature to the benefit of the ego. Wow, that is absolutely key right there. The reward for such behavior is always the recognition the ego gets from the collective ego or the group we, or from the ego and others. Therefore, when saying the inner no to another, it is important to avoid eye-to-eye -eye contact as well as any form of confrontation since either of these affirms and gives energy to the ego to continue. In addition, saying the inner no supports the person's true self that has been imprisoned by the ego. 
The maiden given in marriage is a metaphor for the mind, the two frontal lobes when it is married to the inner senses. In the correct functioning of the mind, the sensations coming from a person's common sense, the consensus of all his senses, are compared to his inner truth memories of what cosmic harmony feels like and sent to the imaging mind where the sensations are formed into images. These images are then translated by the word mind into words that express inner truth. This is a correct marriage of the mind with all a person's other innate capabilities and is manifested in the centered self. No part of this process can be bypassed to create the centered self. The creation of the ego disrupts this process and leads the mind to increasing estrangement from the person's true nature. In the health, healthy psyche, the common sense serves both to keep us from drifting into error and to protect us from spells and projections coming from others, among other dangers. However, our common sense is hindered by phrases and images. We have accepted that demonize some senses as, some senses as lower and exaggerate others as higher. Such ideas put spells on both, causing the senses of outer seeing and outer hearing to become virtually the only active senses of perception. This deprives us of the, of the clarity that comes when all the senses are combined in a complete consensus. The primacy given to the outer senses of seeing and hearing is one of the primary steps in the perversion of our original nature, causing us to focus on the appearance of things and hearsay about them. The inner senses, which tell us when things smell bad, have a bad taste, and feel inappropriate, are shut off. The spell also blocks our access to our inner truth. Another effect of the spell created by assigning primacy to outer seeing and hearing is the enslavement of the two frontal lobes to the thinking mind. Uh, sorry, there's like quotations here that aren't in quotation. Of the two frontal lobes, which are the thinking mind and the imaging mind, to the purposes of the collective ego. The thinking mind is given the enormous burden of providing all the rationales the ego needs, regardless of their truth. Because the ego thinks in terms of opposites, every ego rationale is countered by another, creating endless inner debates in the mind about what is right and what is wrong. Such constant activity and the futility of these debates, which are based purely on what is seen or heard, blocks, block access to the person's inner truth. The marriage of the maiden represents the point in a person's development when his thinking and intuitive minds, also called the intellect, are ready to be freed from their bondage to the ego and reunited with the person's true nature, which is his animal nature. When a person has thus securely reestablished his loyalty to his inner truth, the maturation of the true self can be said to be complete. Line one, the wild goose gradually draws near the shore. The young son is in danger. There is talk, no blame. The wild goose is drawing near the shore is a metaphor for the true self in the beginning of its liberation from enslavement by the ego. The shore is a metaphor for a place of safety where the goose can hide itself in the reeds and bushes. Drawing near the shore means that while the true self is not yet free of its bondage, the person has nevertheless made progress in overcoming the ego in himself by refusing to listen to its loud voice. He has also made progress through freeing himself of the guilt spell that was put on his animal nature. The young son is in danger refers to the person's rational mind that is still under the influence of the ego and continues to attack him with the doubt that his true self is capable of leading the personality. This is the talk referred to. No blame is saying there will be no blame if he stands up to the ego by saying the inner no to its attacks. An important part of growing up is standing up to the ego and not being intimidated by its loud noises. <laughs> Line two, the wild goose gradually draws near the cliff, eating and drinking in peace and concord, good fortune. The cliff represents yet another step of progress in the development of the true self. The doubts mentioned in line one have been overcome so that the person has gained a new measure of confidence to enjoy the nourishment of the cosmos. This is his good fortune. The collective ego expects that the developed person should naturally share his nourishment with others. See the second part of Willem's commentary to this line. However, sharing one's cosmic nourishment with another when the ego is present is a throwaway of self and a throwaway of one's cosmic gifts. One may correctly share such gifts only when another's true self is present and when a true interconnection exists. 
Even then, they are to be shared only in proportion to the other's receptivity and openness. This line also wants to make a person aware that the nourishment and fulfillment he receives from the bodily expression of his love is valid and healthy. Such nourishment can never come from sexuality practiced for its own sake, for that is when sexuality becomes perverted, whether in marriage or outside of it. The ability to love is damaged when love is divided into um, divine good and earthly evil aspects. It is the healthy expression of love and sexuality that renews a person's life force. The marriage of the main mentioned in the main text is also a metaphor for the sexual union of two people's true selves. Line three, the wild goose gradually draws near the plateau. The man goes forth and does not return. The woman carries a child but does not bring it forth. It furthers to fight off robbers. The plateau is not the wild goose's natural habitat. The metaphor, therefore, suggests that the true self has been drawn into a dangerous place by ideas that would rob it of its sovereignty, making it difficult for the person to return to his true nature. A person may receive this line when he has acted from the belief put forward by the collective ego that doing the work of self-development means working on developing his higher nature under the guidance of a human master. He does this in order to become a person of spiritual rank. By, thus, by his thus aspiring to become an image, his true self is held back from developing further, held from developing further, held to a plateau. The woman stands for his receptivity to the sage, which in this case is shut off through following a human master. Therefore, his true self remains a child. It furthers to fight off robbers and forms him that it is not too late to resist the ego's false leadership. A person may also receive this line because he has literally interpreted the I Ching's counsel to take action and thus has only created more difficulties. Now, the ego, which has led him to the incorrect interpretation, seeks to blame the unfortunate results on the sage. The I Ching's counsel to undertake something always means inner action, specifically saying the inner no to what is incorrect, both in oneself and in others. The woman represents the true self that would have known what the sage meant if he had only listened to his inner truth. This line calls attention to an authority spell the person is under that causes him to remain in a child-parent relationship instead of growing up. He needs to seek out a self-image he holds of being inadequate, as in needing a human authority figure to tell him what is right and wrong, and deprogram him. Line four, the wild goose gradually draws near the tree. Perhaps it will find a flat branch, no blame. The flat branch represents those times in life when the person who is bringing his true self to maturity is placed in difficult situations. People formerly in his circle resent that he no longer takes part in their ego activities. They misunderstand his behavior and challenge him to explain or defend himself in attempts to draw him into ego confrontations. He needs to say the inner no to their incorrect behavior, then ask the sage in their presence to intervene with the egos in them. Thereafter, he allows events to develop without interference. He, he rests on a, or he rests on a flat branch and remains reserved with them until the sage has intervened. Acting in this way removes all blame from the situation, for there is no longer any basis for discord. Line five, the wild goose gradually draws near the summit. For three years, the woman has no child. In the end, nothing can hinder her, good fortune. The summit represents a person having ascended the ladder of spiritual success erected by the collective ego, only to find that he was mistaken in taking that path. If he recognizes that he has allowed the ego to fool him through flattery and now repudiates that path, he returns to his true self. The helpers consequently welcome him back into their circle. Three years is a reference to the fate the person has created for himself, which is either expired by the mistaken ideas having burned out or has ended through his having corrected himself. The fate was created by his acquiescing in what the collective ego called self-development. No child refers to the hindrance this created to the growth of his true self. Line six, the wild goose gradually draws near the cloud heights. Its feathers can be used for the sacred dance, good fortune. From the cosmic viewpoint, the metaphor of the cloud heights means out of the clouds, out of the grasp of the ego with its delusions, flatteries, fears, and doubts, out of confusion and disorder and into clarity. 
Here, the true self is pictured as emerging to lead the personality with all parts of the person unified into a single being and a single psyche. The person is whole, complete, and in harmony with the cosmos. The image given in this line can also describe the effect of an inner no we have said to another's ego behavior. If we then turn the matter over to the cosmos, it can discipline the ego and free its true self from its grip. However, when its true self then shows itself, it is important to remain on guard stay neutral and not open ourselves prematurely until his true self has become firmly established. This prevents the ego in him, which is still strong, from interpreting our openness as weakness, which would allow it to prey upon our true self. When this happens, it steals the victory and gains control over the relationship. In the words of the metaphor of this line, it plucks the true self and decorates it with its feathers to dance the sacred dance of victory. Yeah. The line can also indicate a person who has reached the goal of self-development as defined by the collective ego. The metaphor of the goose's feathers being used for the sacred dance points to a person's having sacrificed his animal nature in order to overcome his body's supposed evil influence. The self-flattery of being taken into the heavenly realm after having conquered his lower nature is the good fortune imagined. However, in, quote, leaving the earth far behind, as Wilhelm's commentary puts it, he is actually leaving behind the source of his life force. The earth is the living entity and consciousness that nourishes a person in every possible way. Beliefs that demonize the earth and our connection with it are the source of illnesses that can lead to an untimely death. By cutting himself off from his bodily nature through his feelings, which through his feelings connect him with the earth's life force, he becomes a person without a head, as described in Hexagram 8, holding together line 6, or a walking dead person. He lacks the ability to further connect with the cosmic whole. The collective ego has erected its own monument of spiritual perfection. The perfected person who has fought evil in himself and then crusades against evil in the world. The definition of evil is whatever the collective ego has designated as such at any given moment, poverty, crime, chaos, etc. In this effort, the hero must necessarily see culprits that must either be overcome and repressed or extinguished. These ideas have given rise to the great crusades, wars, and inquisitions of Western history and the genocides that have occurred worldwide. The sage teaches us that the word culprit has no cosmic basis. Evil comes only from the mistaken ideas that each individual holds in his psyche. Each individual is solely responsible for what he permits to reside in his psyche. For inasmuch as he allows these ideas within himself, he separates from the cosmic whole. Chief among these destructive ideas are the ideas of there being a culprit and of original fault. These ideas must not be allowed to give rise to outer action or to hostile thoughts, but are to be deprogrammed by each person saying the inner no to them. Say the inner no to the word culprit. That's, that's the teaching here, you know, that the word in and of itself creates that demonic consciousness. And we as humans need to grow up and um, come to understand what our gift, of, cosmic gift of language actually means and what it's to be used for. It's to be used to communicate cosmic truth, not to create false realities and or demonic spheres of consciousness with these false words. The words in and of themselves are wrong. That's the key here. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching right there. And don't forget to like and subscribe down below. And I'll see you guys in the next one.